Well, good morning again, everyone. Are you like me uh, in subscribing to the theory that you can tell the age of the summer by how many mosquito bites you have that have scabbed over versus the ones that are fresh? Are you with me in that? So uh, I spent a lot of weekend outside uh, and uh, my, my ankles, I was putting my socks on this morning and it was just like torture to put the socks on there. So the summer is waning on us, right? It is not waxing, it is waning. And uh, it's a great opportunity for us today to pause and to continue thinking about wisdom, especially in conjunction with making plans. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Um, just by way of reminder, as we've been talking about the Proverbs, um, we're reminded that this book is not just the these random sayings. There are lots of different topics and it jumps around a lot, but all of these things are pulling from the law and the prophets. So the revealed word of God, Solomon and, and the others that are writing and collecting these Proverbs together, they're taking the things that the law says, that the prophets say, and they're thinking, how do we live this out? And so what we're reminded as we think of the book of Proverbs together is that wise and righteous living is only possible for individuals who are in community with God. All right, wise, truly wise, biblically wise, and righteous living is only possible for those of us who are living in community with God, who've placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And therefore, dependence upon God is a necessary thing, though we're strongly encouraged to pursue wisdom, to make wise choices, to, to uh, submit our plans to God's plans and all those kinds of things. Um, we have to depend on him and his strength. It's not just about us and what we're learning to do. We're not being released to autonomy. We're being called to greater and greater dependence the more wise we become. The ongoing acquisition of wisdom is through fearing the Lord. That's the theme of Proverbs, that it is through the fear of the Lord that we begin to, uh, to acquire wisdom. And so that's the mark of trust, and it's the exercise. Uh, the exercise of that, excuse me, is, is the product of the Spirit. As, as God himself works in us, we grow in wisdom, we grow in faith. Our fear of him increases in such a way that it produces change, it produces, uh, it produces growth in him. So if you will, turn with me to the book of Proverbs. Turn to Proverbs 16. And um, this is something that I think is, is especially applicable to people who have recently graduated, people who are moving on to, to different things in life, some transitional things. But whether you are, uh, if you'll pardon the metaphor, in the beginning of your summer or the end of your summer, all right, um, there's still application for us. Whatever phase of life you might find yourself in, as we think about what God wants us to do with our plans, with our habits, with our customs, with our way of life, God wants us to make a change today, whatever, whatever phase we might be at. So let's look at Proverbs 16. We're gonna focus in on these first three verses together today. Proverbs 16, verse one, I'm reading from the ESV. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Why don't we just pause and ask the Spirit of God to work in us today. Heavenly Father, thank you for the inspired and revealed word under which we sit this morning. And Lord, I would ask in humility that anything that I say up here from this platform would be in accordance with your truth. And Lord, that you would cause all hearts in this room gather together for this purpose of worship, of edification, to be willing to change, willing to listen. Uh, Lord, willing to be unseated where necessary so that we may honor and glorify you in our pursuit of wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to talk about three words today. Plans, ways, and work. That's what we see here in the text. The plans of the heart, the ways of a man, commit your work to the Lord. Now, one thing as we begin here, we're looking at Hebrew poetry, and so you'll notice there's sort of a statement and another statement, all right? And these are called uh, parallel structures or couplets. So there's sort of two thoughts that go together, and they're either there to one, say, and then support or, or uh, you know, compare a little bit, or they're there to contrast. This is true, but, you know, this is, this is true. So there's sort of a, a two-statement kind of thing in Hebrew poetry, confirming and supporting or, or contrasting one another. We'll also notice that there's sort of two agents at work in these verses, man and his choices and God. There are two people at work in these verses, and we have to kind of understand how these, these two agents play together. We see that God is a sovereign judge, all right, but man has a choice. Man has a choice to submit himself and his ways to God or to operate independently with ramifications, all right? And our plans, our ways, and our work, all of these things we're gonna see today, they have so much to do, not just with our mind, with our intellect, but with our hearts, 
We make choices out of our hearts. So let's talk about this first one together. And we think about plans and words, because that's our parallel, the plans of the heart and the answer, the words of the tongue, right? These words, these words concern our disposition. These words concern our disposition. All right, so uh, I'm thinking of Mary Poppins, my favorite Disney movie, all right? And when Michael and Jane are putting out their, their advertisement, or that, their advertisement, right, for, uh, for a new nanny, they say, uh, if you want this choice position, you have to have a cheery disposition, right? So the word disposition that we're after today has to do with our character. It has to do with who we are at the core of our being, the kinds of things that we exhibit. Now, before I go any deeper there, when you think of the term plans, um, where are the people in the room who are the detail you know, itemized lists, uh, following your plan. This is what I've laid out, right? My wife's hand is up over here. Now, where is everyone else like me, who tends to be a little more spontaneous? I'm gonna figure this out as I go. I wish I'd planned that a little better, but you know what, hey, it worked, right? That's, okay, so that's where I am on this. So, um, Tara, when, when we have a day home and you ask me, what are, what's your plan for the day? What's my response? Yes, <laughs> you know what, that's how, that's, you're exactly right, but what, but what I say to you is I plan to have no plans, right, that's, that's my response, so when we have, free, by the way, free time is this thing where you go and you don't have any pressing house projects, and the kids don't need rides anywhere, and um, you know, you're not working on like something for your degree, like free time, I know it's a strange concept, but it happens sometimes, and when it does, I said to Tara, I plan to have no plans, and that's my spontaneous spirit, you know, I want, basically what that means is I want to go home, I want to put a record on, and I want to sit and read my book, okay, that's, that's literally what I want to do with my afternoon, but that being said, this actually has less to do with sort of what we plan to do and more with our heart attitude, our disposition, who we are and what we do with the options and choices that are available to us. So when we think about this, there's a couple of different translations and if you're reading from a different one this morning, you might have instead of the word plans, the word preparations or the word reflections. And so again, this is an interesting word because it's used in multiple different places in the Old Testament, but this Hebrew word um, is only here in this this verse translated as the word plans in English, what it actually means, it's the root word is a word for, it's a military term, it means to set in rows. So if you can kind of imagine the armies, you know, assembling on parade, right? And, and if they're all unruly and chaotic and just wandering wherever with their spears and their slingshots just kind of, you know, not, not held properly and stuff like, because we're using biblical, you know, military terms here, um, you know, the army is not in any position to be mobilized, right? They're not, they're not ready to receive orders, they're not ready for assessment. Um, and so the idea I think here is that conditioned soldiers who are wise and prepared, they're, they're ready. They're set in rows and in order. The order or disposition of the heart, as it were, the plans of the heart, the inner man or the will, this is what we're, we're talking about. It's the inclination of a man's heart toward righteousness and wisdom or towards evil and chaos. That's the contrast that we're seeing here. The plans of the heart belong to man. Either we're inclined to walk in wisdom the way that God is, is, would have us to do, or we're more inclined to walk according to our own ways. And, and the Bible is sort of comparing that to chaos. That's unruly. That's not set in, in rows. Now, another metaphor I was thinking of in, in connection with that to set in rows, you kind of, I had this image as a kid of the parable of the sower where the, you know, he's scattering the seed and in my mind, I'm kind of thinking of that like a, like a leprechaun, just kind of like scattering that stuff around everywhere. And so it's kind of chaotic because the seed just kind of falls wherever it wants to go. But I think a little, maybe a better image is not this willy nilly scattering because you need to plant your things in rows, right? In order to be able to, to care for them and tend them well and harvest. And so that parable of the soil is all, uh, of, the, of the sower is actually all about the soil. It's about the preparation to be ordered in such a way, to be planted in such a way that there's going to be a good harvest. It's the good soil of a good heart, according to that parable, that produces much fruit. So our question is, what is our heart's disposition towards God? What is our heart's disposition towards God? And again, what we started out reminding ourselves is the only way that, that we're gonna have a good disposition, the only way that we're really gonna pursue wisdom and, and live in accordance with what God's word says is if our hearts belong to God. This is not something that we as human beings come into naturally, right? Every intention of the man's heart is evil from his birth, 
right? Because we have a sin nature, we're fallen. And so when we think about you know, the way the world wants to fix things and improve things, it's all about self-improvement. This is about allowing the Spirit of God to do the transform- transforming work in our hearts so that we're changed from his power, not just from our ability to, to get better at following God's commands. When we think about plans of the heart, the other, the other thing that strikes me about this is you know, you think about plans as more of an intellectual thing. I'm thinking through what I'm going to do. But this phrase is plans of the heart, not of the mind, not of the future. So maybe what we need to ask ourselves here is, you know, how we plan and what we plan, or in my case, fail to plan, it's going to depend on our goals, our values, our priorities, what's in our hearts. So therefore, if plans of the hearts belong to man, then what do our tendencies reveal about us? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ today and you look at your tendencies, what is, what is your disposition? Are you more inclined to submit your heart and your ways to God's word and do what he says? Or are you more inclined to do what you want to do, to live more according to your own standards? What happens also when we're forced to make a split-second decision without time to plan? What just comes out, right? If we're in ordered rows, if we're prepared, if our disposition is towards God to do his will, then our response is going to be different than otherwise. Now, the question is, again, we got two statements here. The plans of the, Lord, of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Two statements. How do these things go together? Well, there's a lot of different ideas as I've been studying this week and thinking about how to, how to apply this best. Um, there's lots of different ways to translate some of these ideas and, and different connections between the two, and, and no commentator says the same thing as the other one. So here's, here's some thoughts that I was having. What's the connection between the plans of man's heart and God's influence over our words? Because that's what it's saying here. The plans of the heart belong to man. That's the realm of, of us. But the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Somehow God is sovereign over that. Uh, and I don't think that that means that God isn't sovereign over man's plans. We'll see that in just a moment. But it means that he's sovereign over the mouth. He's sovereign over the affairs of the human heart. Uh, it means that God can use our choices and our words in various different ways. I'm thinking that God even can use evil choices to accomplish his purposes. If you Actually, if you look down at verse 4, look at what that says. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Now, that's interesting. That's heavy, and we don't have time to talk about all that. But clearly, God uses even the evil choices of people to accomplish his purposes. I'm thinking also of, of Joseph's story. You remember Joseph's story that he sold into slavery, you know, in jail for years, and because God shows him steadfast love and mercy, he raised, he's raised up to this position of influence, and he actually is in a position to save his whole family who threw him into slavery, right, sold him because they were jealous of him, and to show them kindness. And you remember Joseph's words to them at the end of, of the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 50, when, when his brothers are fearful that now that, you know, that their father has passed, that Joseph is going to bring wrath upon them. And Joseph says, you know, no, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. So God can use those things. God can use those things. Now, the, the King James Version actually translates this verse, verse 1 of Proverbs 16, as the preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. That's a little bit different, isn't it? Because it's not a contrast, it's a supporting statement. It's saying the the plans and the answer belong to the Lord. So I think that sense is here. And clearly what we do as human beings, you know, our, our plans and our intentions are expressed both in what we say and what we do. Uh, we see the, you know, the answer of, of the tongue is from the Lord here in verse 16. But if you look down in verse nine, we have this idea of the heart of man planning his ways and the Lord establishing his steps. God has his sovereignty in both areas. But here's what I like best. Here's how I'm thinking it makes the most sense to me as I'm reading this passage. The word for answer in Hebrew is a word for response, and it actually means the most appropriate or effective thing to say in a given scenario. So if you've ever, if you've ever thought, um, you know, you've been around someone who just knew like what, what was the right thing to say in a moment of, of, of trial or hardship or, or loss, and you were at a loss for words, but man, this person, they just knew what to say. It's that kind of idea. Look, at, uh, look down at verse 23 of, of chapter 16. These ideas are everywhere in the Proverbs, but I really like seeing them in the same section here. Chapter 16, verse 23 says, the heart of the wise makes his speech judicious, 
and adds persuasiveness to his lips. He knows how to speak, how to argue, how to articulate well, argue in the sense of, of, of making his point, all right? Verse 24 says, gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body, words aptly spoken. Now, look over back a little bit, chapter 15, back a page, look at verse one. We get this famous verse, a soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stirs up anger. A word appropriately spoken with the right tone. And then one more, verse 23 of chapter 15 says, to make an apt answer, an appropriate answer is a joy to a man. I love this. A word in season, how good it is. A word in season, how good it is. So words appropriately spoken, effective in a given circumstance. The way I understand what this, this passage is saying is this. I think man can plan profane things or can plan good things, but only God can produce effective and uplifting words from a man's mouth. Man can plan profane things and good things, right? Good and bad. But only God can produce out of the mouth of a human being effective and uplifting words. I'm reminded of the book of James. Will you read this with me together? And and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast, bird, reptile, sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Verse 8, but no human being can tame the tongue. No human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. And here we see the same, where we can plan good, where we can plan evil, we can also say good and also say evil, right? That, that duplicity is there. Verse nine, with it, with the tongue, we bless the Lord, our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. So here, here's the point, right? We in our natural state don't have good control over our mouths. We don't. But with the influence of of the spirit in our life, man, God can take our speech and transform it into something that is efficacious, that can produce change and encouragement in a way that I couldn't do it on my own, right? But having an apt word in in, in the right time, that's a mark of wisdom. That's a mark of the fact that I'm pursuing what God wants and he is transforming me. Remember, Jesus said, it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. So only a heart that's dependent upon the Lord and steeped in his word is poised to be useful to him. <laughs> That's convicting to me because I don't, I, I would love to bleed scripture. I would love to, the words of God to come out of my mouth. It's not my natural way of speaking. Not unless I've had an entire week to prepare for it, right? Um, so we have to be mindful of the fact that our tongues can be used for evil things and only God can produce that. Now the believer, this is an incredible encouragement. I've always kind of wrestled with this verse in, in the New Testament. Um, but the believer whose heart and mind are set on the things of God needs not fear. Cause look what Jesus says, talking about persecution and, and giving an answer for the gospel. When they deliver you over, that is to be tried and possibly executed. Do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Again, God can produce out of our mouths when we are willing vessels for him to use and we are steeped in his word, the type of communication that can make a difference. Where I don't, I don't even have to be prepared, it says. Now, I want to be prepared. And, 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 and you know, again, it's sort of that, that sort of disposition. What is my tendency? You know, where, where is my heart in this? And God can use that, but it's him who's going to produce those kinds of words. We might not even know as Christians when we're speaking to somebody's situation how our words will be received. But I think you and I can probably both attest to the fact that God can use what we say in ways that we wouldn't even have planned. Like you can, you can see how I said this, and maybe I don't even remember saying that, but someone's like, that meant so much to me. Like that really encouraged me, and this is how I grew from it. That's the spirit of God at work. What we see is that God is in the process of redeeming our words and our choices as he's reclaiming us from the inside out. As he works in our heart, he's in the process of reclaiming our words and our choices as a result as he reclaims our hearts from the inside out. So the plans of the heart belong to man, Proverbs 16, one, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. May our disposition match God's disposition. May it be revealed in the plans and words that we make that align with his wisdom, with his will, with his character, with his purposes. Let's look at verse two together. We're gonna say plans and words concern our disposition. 
Number two, ways and spirit, those are our parallel words, concern our motives. Ways and spirit concern our motives. Proverbs 16, two. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. The word pure there means clean, undefiled, religiously appropriate, right? That there is no cause for judgment. And the assumption is that as a human being, I'm acquainted with myself well, I've judged my own motives, and I've discerned them to be good. There's a problem with that, isn't there? Because you and I know that our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked, as the Bible tells us. And, and there is no one who can know the heart, truly, except for the judge. So the word ways here, let's start with the word ways. This word means, you know, how and what we do. It's our, our deeds and acts. Or maybe most clearly, it's a custom. It's a behavior or a mode of life. It's, it's kind of like a, a, a routine, something that we are, are set in. And we see this word. This is a popular word in this passage. Kind of follow the word with me, if you will. So verse 2, we see the ways of man, all right? In verse 7, we see when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. All right, verse nine, now we get two of our words. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Look at, look at verse 17. The highway of the upright turns aside from evil. Whoever guards his way preserves his life. All right, verse 25. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. So this is, this is a, a pattern. It's a means of walking. It's a custom. It's, a, it's also a word that can be used for a distance or a journey. And I kind of get the image because the word sort of a, a well-traveled path is kind of uh, the, image, the, the intended image of the words. Um, you know, potholes, they're like, they're like the Lord testing our sanctification a little bit. You know, when you, when you hit a pothole and, you know, how hard you hit it is, depends on what manner of profanity comes out of your mouth as you're bouncing up and over it and, like, the dollar signs are going off in your head because you're assuming you just left your muffler back there. But, you know, when you think about potholes and, and, and you know, when you're driving your favorite section of your commute where, uh, you know, the wheels are going to come off your car, that's, that's like a headache. You know, that's not something that's comfortable. So I'm thinking of more like an ancient road unpaved prior to this kind of technology, right, where you've got wagon wheels that are, that are sort of carving those ruts, those furrows in the road, where it's easy to kind of follow that track. And, you know, there's a, there's a comfort in that because for us, you know, the, the pothole means, you know, that the road needs to be taken care of and fixed and stuff like that. But for someone traveling an ancient road where there's, you know, fewer mile markers and signs and things like that, to be on that well-traveled path means I know I'm going the right way. You know, because I'm following where all my neighbors have traveled, where the markets are, you know, I know this is the direction. This is the way to the city, okay? Now, with that, there's a comfort because I know the, I know the path. There's also a danger, isn't there, in, in this ancient kind of context because when you're traveling the main roads, you've got to worry about robbers, right? You've got to worry about thieves and bandits because the people who are traveling most are probably the wealthiest people going to buy and sell their wares and things like that. So there's a danger in there. And, and I think that's an appropriate way to think about the ways of a man being pure in his own eyes. Our ways are things that we feel comfortable in, but there is an inherent danger to them right? There's an inherent danger to them because of the very nature of being comfortable. And so we have to think about what do our tendencies, what do our learned behaviors and habits say about our motives, say about us, all right? So, uh, you know, we tend to be creatures of habit with these kinds of learned behaviors, and we don't always attribute a sense of right and wrong to a habit, to, you know, to your, to your nail biting or to your, uh, you know, response to uh, these external stimuli that are challenging you in some way, your, your gut reaction. We don't, we don't necessarily always put a moral value on them, but let's think about this. You know, our habits, they're indicative of what makes us feel secure, and, and comfortable, they produce a result. I do this because it makes me feel safe, you know, or, or I respond this way because the last time I responded this way, it made the problem go away. So it's, it's learned behavior, right? We become comfortable, and our habits make us feel a little bit more in control. They make us feel a little bit more in control because I'm soothing myself in some way or I'm, I'm pacifying some kind of thing outside of myself. So I feel a little bit more in control. And again, as human beings, everything we do, all of our ways, they originate from our hearts. These are not things that are disconnected from what's going on here, what's going on here, 
right? All our ways originate from the heart. Even our unconscious habits, they have motives attached to them because as human beings made in the image of a, of a moral creator, we are moral beings. All of our choices have ethics attached to them, right and wrong and, 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 and good and evil. And I think maybe the thing that I'm, I'm most pulling away from this passage is, I think as a Christian, I don't have room to be unconscious in any of my behaviors. I think as a Christian, I don't have room to be unconscious in my behaviors and assume that I'm doing well. Now that's hard because there are all kinds of things that I do without even thinking about it. And I think therein lies the problem. I think we need to be evaluating our ways and not just assuming that they're pure because that's my natural inclination. We tend to rationalize and justify our motives and behaviors, but we need to be mindful of the fact that true discernment belongs to the Lord. He sees our heart. He judges our motives. I love the way the Apostle Paul captures this. He's like in the process of kind of defending his ministry a little bit, you know, more in 2 Corinthians, but also here as well, because there's these adversaries. He says this, with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In other words, your estimation of me matters little because I stand before the judge. In fact, I don't even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It's the Lord who judges me. Man, what if, what if we had that attitude? Not just assuming that, you know, I'm okay with myself and my decisions, and, and this is a safe place to be, but rather, man, God's the one who judges me. I don't discern my own right and wrong here. God's the judge. He sees my internal motives. Now, the word for spirit in in the ESV, right? All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. That's the Hebrew word for something that's immaterial, the soul, the heart, or it's also used for the word wind. So those those words are used interchangeably. And I think that's intentional. I don't think that's supposed to create like, well, is he talking about the wind like blowing through the trees or is he talking about the soul of a man or something? Like that's not to cause confusion. That's to say that as God controls and directs these immaterial, invisible things like the forces of nature, He sees and discerns these immaterial things of the spirit of man within. I think that that's sort of a play on words in Hebrew a little bit, right? If God can measure and quantify and direct and control the wind, he can discern our unseen intentions and desires that you and I, who are making these choices, can't even see ourselves. That's the God we serve. He sees those things. You know, uh, parents, why do we bribe our children? Because it works. Right, it works, okay? How many jelly beans are you giving your kids when you're potty training? Is that, is there, is, is like a specific number you're supposed to do? We're at like, what are we at? We're, like, we're supposed to do like five for a number two and like three for a number one. That's kind of what we're, we're not actually, you know, we're, we're, we're talking conceptually about potty training. We're not quite there yet. But you bribe your child because you're trying to produce a certain behavior, okay? And it's like, oh, this is great. It worked. He did it, you know? But what are we changing in that kind of scenario? We're not talking about a heart, right? We're not talking about like changing a value or a belief or something. We're talking about changing a behavior. And, you know, we can obey for the wrong reasons, right? My, my son, you know, it, it, like we see this all the time. It's like, you know, there's, there's a, a fear of a consequence or there's a thing that I want. So, I'll, you know, I'll, yes, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do this because, uh, you know, I want the result. And, and if we're not careful as parents, we just, we're okay with that because we're getting the behavior that we want. We miss the opportunity to address these kinds of heart motives, even in, in young children, right? Young children understand these things from a very, very young age. And what's worse is when we fall into that mentality, as adults, we do the same exact thing. We do the same exact thing. We just, we address our own behaviors and we never really look at our hearts and say, well, what was my motive in that? What was I after? What's my value? What's influencing that kind of decision? We take an easy approach versus the challenging approach. And again, the Lord is the one who sees our our, our, our real motives, our real intentions. The Lord judges on the basis of why we choose because he sees the human hearts. I'm reminded of uh, when Jesus is, is uh, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking about different things. At least three different occasions, he talks about you know, sort of the importance of, of worshiping in secret, that sort of private devotion, and, and, you know, which is an important thing, but there's also the, you know, the public devotion. But what he says is that the, the Lord or the, or the Father who sees in secret will reward you because he sees the motive, the why. Why are you doing this? Why are you giving me service and worship? Is it 
for a good motive? Is it for a selfish motive? As a matter of fact, God actually blesses godly motives. God blesses godly motives. That's, that's maybe a loaded statement in our context, but look at what verse 7 says of Proverbs 16. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. The blessing in that, right? Not a, not a material blessing and not always the blessing that we expect, but when we choose to evaluate our motives and, and to make choices from the place of, I want God's glory in this, God's gonna, God's gonna honor that in some way. God's gonna see that in some way, maybe in this life, maybe in the life to come. But God works in those ways. The reality for us as human beings is that we can personally justify anything we set out to do, can't we? We can personally justify anything that we set out to do. All right, I was thinking of the, the great songwriter Bob Dylan this morning and his song, uh, God on Our Side. Anybody know that song? It's a classic anti-war anthem. Um, but he, you know, he's talking about the fact that every single culture that has ever declared war, and he's kind of being self-critical about America and that, but um, you know, every single culture that has declared war has said God is on our side in this. God's behind us. We have all these justifications for why it's good for us to go and invade Poland or do whatever we're gonna do, okay? And so when we think about our individual choices and how we perceive God being in approval of us, all right, we kind of have a tendency to assume God's on our side in this. Like we're in the right, our ways are pure. We can be satisfied with, with being self-deceived and thinking that God is on our side. We can also be self-satisfied in, in our own thinking, completely self-deceived. But again, God is the final judge of his behavior. I really like the, um, the NEB translation of, of this passage. It says, uh, a man's whole conduct may be pure in his own eyes, but the Lord fixes a standard for the spirit of man. The Lord fixes the standard for the spirit of man. God himself, his character, his word is the standard. Again, God deciphers our true intentions. Now, we have no problem uh, probably seeing how people tend to be arrogant about their opinions. I'm sure you're never arrogant about your opinions. Verse five tells us they are. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Our opinions, our views, they're deeply personal and we equate them with truth, don't we? Our opinions... Our ideas, they're deeply personal, and we equate them with truth. That's a problem, right? Now, you've probably heard of our society being referred to as postmodern, right? Postmodern society. I think that we're beyond postmodern, and I believe we are at the post-truth society. We're at the post-truth society, and I have an example for you. You're not going to be able to read this if you're six rows back, so I'll read it to you, okay? This is just some random inter interchange on the internet, people arguing, of course, all right? This person, they're talking about road tripping or something. I don't even know the context, but 2,000 miles isn't that much, honestly. I could drive that much in, in a day, 2,000 miles. I could drive that in a day. Second person says, if you drove a steady 75 miles per hour without ever slowing down or stopping, it would take you over 26 hours to drive 2,000 miles more than a day. The first person comes back, well, assuming you're correct, then let's suppose that I didn't sleep to have more time in a day. Then I could probably make it. And what are your sources for your data? <laughs> Person number two comes back. Source, 2,000 by 75 is 26.66666667. It's called math. You should try it sometime. <laughs> and here's the kicker. Person one comes back. Well, I'm not sure I agree, but okay. <laughs> All right. Now, this is just about math, right? What, if, what about our morals? What about our choices? What about our values? Man, it doesn't matter what evidence you can show somebody that they're wrong, they're still gonna think they're right because we live in a post-truth society. Christians, by the way, you are not guiltless of this because you and I assume that God is on our side, therefore we can't be wrong. That's a faulty premise. If we are not living in accordance with what God's word tells us, by faith, by grace, right? With forgiveness, with mercy, okay? We cannot be pleasing to the Lord if we are walking in our own way and justifying it on the basis that, well, I prayed that prayer, you know, so Jesus is with me, he's for me, all right? 
we're missing the point if that's our mentality and we're, we're being part of this idea of being a post-truth society. Even com- when confronted with evidence, human beings will still hold to their version of what's true. So you and I, we need to have the humility of spirit to acknowledge that it is God, not our hearts, that is the standard of right and wrong and that godly ethics are clearly revealed for us in God's word. God's word shows us how we are to live. We're not pleasing God by what we do if we are saying, I'm going to live however I want and trust that grace is going to cover this. That's that's not the biblical pattern. That's not wisdom according to the book of Proverbs. So Proverbs 16, 2, all the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. So may our values, our patterns, our priorities, our motives reflect a true purity of heart before the Lord. Let's look at this last one together. We're, uh, plans and words concern our disposition. Ways and spirit concern our motives. And thirdly, work and plans concern our ambitions. Look at uh, Proverbs 16, 3. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Now we love that verse. I love that verse, right? Because that means that if I trust God, then my plans will come to fruition. Mm, let's be careful. Let's, let's think about this, okay? Work and plans concern our ambitions, what we want in life, where we want to go, what we want to see happen, all right? The word work here, it refers to a, a variety of different things, activities, deeds, and accomplishments. So it could be our actual job, or it could be be anything that we really set our, our, our hands and our hearts to do. The, the Hebrew there actually, it sort of speaks of rolling your works upon the Lord. That's, that's the verb in Hebrew is to roll your works upon the Lord. That means that I'm taking a burden of care off myself and I'm laying the matter before him. The NEB again says, uh, commit to the Lord all you do. In other words, I'm committing whatever my goals are, whatever my purposes are, whatever I'm intending to do, my plans, and I'm giving them to God, right? I'm submitting them to God. Now, uh, you know, in an agricultural society like the, the Old Testament Hebrews were in, it's a lot easier to kind of see that because we're planting seeds and we're waiting. You know, we're saying, I got some work to do, but then I got to trust God to give the increase. Um, whereas in our society, because we are, you know, we, if we work hard, we'll get noticed and we'll get a promotion. Or, you know, if I, if I learn these skills, if I, if I get this grade when I graduate, then I'll be much more, you know, marketable. And, and someone's going to hire me. And so, uh, you know, in, in our kind of specialized work environment society, we feel much more in control of our work, right? Because I make a lot of choices that affect my future. So, and, and you know, that's not to say that people in the Old Testament didn't have the same mentality about, you know, uh, trying to, to grow their, you know, their, their profit margins and all that kind of stuff. But, like, we sort of can, can, can struggle maybe in a different way with thinking that we're in control of our future, the way that maybe it was a little bit different in the Old Testament context. Here's what I think some of these, some, some ideas here connected to this. You know, I can work faithfully and contentedly in whatever my station of life is because the work that Jesus accomplished purchased my redemption. So my work efforts, my goals and ambitions, they aren't to like make a name for myself anymore. They're not to just get ahead and be more comfortable. It's, you know, I can work in whatever station I might find myself with, you know, just great peace and gratitude because the work, capital W, right, that, that Jesus accomplished secured my eternal inheritance, right? So, so I can work with, with that kind of degree of, of comfort and, and, and peace in that. Now, when we think about the goals, though, because, you know, again, as human beings, we always have things we want. We have things, places we want to go, right, accomplishments we want to we see realized and things like that. So, you know, what I have to be careful of when I think about committing my work to the Lord and my plans being established, I'm not simply asking God to help me with the plan I've laid out. As a Christian, I am not simply asking God to help me with the plan I've laid out. I'm asking him to help me make biblically wise plans and in so doing fulfill his plan. Do you see the contrast? I'm not just saying, hey God, this is my plan. Could you stamp it with your approval and send me on my way? I'm saying, God, if this is the plan you want for my life, would you, would you affirm it? Would you, would you send me? But I will happily change this if you direct me in another way. That's the attitude of humility, of trust and submission that says, God, your plan is bigger than my plan. And I don't know what the future holds, and I'm not actually in control of much of it, right? So I want to go where, where you have me go. When I desire a certain role, title, occupation, accomplishment, achievement, degree, whatever, I have to ask myself if my ambition is ultimately self-glorifying or God-glorifying. 
It's not wrong to want those things, but is my pursuit of them about me glorifying myself, making me feel good, making me feel more comfortable with life, or am I about giving God the glory by stewarding these opportunities and responsibilities well? I need to ask myself that if I'm a Christian. Am I still looking for my career and my plans to give me meaning? What am I gonna do with more money? How is this gonna impact my other areas of stewardship, my family relationships, my ministry, my service to my community? What's this gonna do? You know, I, I like the way MacArthur sums this up. He says, God will fulfill your righteous plans. God will fulfill your righteous plans. And we have to be, think about what that means, right? That, that means it's a plan that according to God is good. It's a right plan. It's a holy plan. It's a, it's a, a plan designed for his glory. When that's my plan, when that's the way I operate, God's gonna affirm that. God's gonna, God's gonna help me build that plan, all right? But again, the only way that I'm gonna lay something like that is if, like we said earlier, my disposition towards the Lord is I'm gonna do what's right, I'm gonna seek wisdom from the word, and I'm living for the glory of God. Then my plans will be righteous. We need to value an ordinary life more than a famous one. We need to value an ordinary life more than a famous one. This is a trap of, of youth ministry um, because it's always easy to, to um, think about our success as how many teenagers show up on a Thursday night or a Wednesday night or whenever ours is Thursday night. Um, you know, and, and to confuse our influence with our reach, right? And as Christians, in whatever way we might be thinking, you know, it could be easy to assume, I don't have people that I can impact, because I don't have a, I'm, I'm not up on the platform, right? Justin, you have that opportunity, but I don't, right? Having an ordinary life is an opportunity for influence. Having, and by the way, I, I, that sounds like I'm saying this is a different life, you have an ordinary life. That's not at all what I'm saying. Whatever station we're in, whatever we find ourselves, wherever God has planted you, you have the opportunity in whatever that life is to make a difference. Can we be average and ordinary everyday citizens, faithful with our lot, striving to impact people in our circles of influence, stewarding our blessings, and be content? I like this quote. This is from a book by Russell Moore called Onward. He says, if the kingdom of heaven is what Jesus says it is, then what matters isn't simply what we neatly classify as spiritual things, our callings, whether we're preaching the gospel or loading docks or picking avocados or filing legal briefs or writing legislation, or herding goats, they aren't accidental. God is teaching us, as he taught our Lord, to learn in little things how to be in charge of great things. You ever thought about your life that way? Whatever job you're currently holding, you feel like this hourly job, man, I hate this, I can't wait to get out of it. How might God be teaching you in that opportunity to have an influence on the people around you and to see ordinary work, regular work, work on this earth? as an opportunity to make a difference for eternity? How are you learning to be faithful in small things so that you can be faithful in, in big things? Maybe the question we just need to ask is, are we ambitious for the kingdom of heaven or are we ambitious for the kingdom of me? Are we ambitious for the kingdom of heaven or are we ambitious for the kingdom of me? Now, in order for me to commit my work to the Lord like this is telling me to do, I've gotta acknowledge that I'm not the master of my own destiny. I've gotta acknowledge that his way is better than mine. I've got to acknowledge that his way might have a different objective than mine. I've got to acknowledge that God knows what we need and what is best. God knows what we need and what is best. As a matter of fact, look at, at verse eight. Look at this in, in Proverbs chapter 16. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. There is a little Better is a little. God knows what I need and what is best. That means I trust his providence, that he has divine and kind appointments, and I trust his sustenance, that he provides kindly and divinely for my needs. I acknowledge that all of my successes are due to him. Even though my skills and knowledge are products of his grace, right? He's the one who ultimately establishes my way, my plans. So may all of our ordinary efforts and labors be done in full dependence upon the Lord, seeking to build his kingdom and not mine. This is what we're saying today. Plans, ways, and work. Plans and words concern our disposition, our heart's inclination towards God's wisdom. Number two, excuse me, number two, ways and spirit concern our motives, the whys of what we do. 
and work in plans that concern our ambitions. What are our goals? What are our objectives? Now, I think that this is the kind of passage, again, Proverbs being so succinct and pithy in the way these things are stated, it's easy to, to misconstrue things with faulty conclusions. So as we close here today, I just want to, this is what this passage is not saying, right? Just to, to clear the air here for a second as we, as we conclude, right? This passage is not implying that God honors and establishes every plan that Christians make. It's not saying that. This passage does not imply that God honors and establishes every plan that Christians make. This passage does not imply that if we petition, invoke, beg, or attempt to bribe God with religious service, that then he will ensure our plan's successes. It's not what this passage is implying. This passage does not mean that God changes his plan to accommodate ours. He's unchanging. And he's all wise. He doesn't change his plan to accommodate ours. This passage does not imply that the success of Christians' plans depends on the level of God's favor toward them. If you were just a little bit of a better prayer, God would bless your plans. That's not what this is saying. This passage um, does not imply that sinful plans and decisions by people are justified based on God's sovereignty. Just because he's in control. Man, I made a bad sinful choice. Well, you know what? That was part of his plan, it was okay, right? There's a difference between what God wills and what God permits, ordains, or uses to accomplish his divine purposes. We cannot assume that our ways are pure before him if they do not match up with God's word. Now, this passage does juxtapose human agency with God's sovereignty, and it prescribes planning, working, and doing according to the word and the will of God. This passage invites us to lay our hearts, desires, and ambitions at the feet of the Almighty and humbly petition him, provided we are willing to say as Jesus did, not my will, but yours be done. Finally, this passage does assert that the only kind of plans, labors, or ambitions approved by the Lord are those that are submitted to his will.